Welcome to another oral history interview, part of the Ozarks Voices Project of the Missouri State University Libraries. I'm Tom Peters, Dean of Library Services. Today's date is Tuesday, September 23rd, 2014, the first full day of autumn. Our special guest today is James F., better known as Jim Barrett, an engineer, a master builder, an author, a performer, and an avid Ozarks historian. Uh, this interview is being conducted at Artie's Restaurant, uh, also known or formerly known as the Hillbilly Bowl Lounge and Family Restaurant in Kimberling City, Missouri, on the shores of Table Rock Lake. Jim, welcome to Ozark's Voices. Thank you, sir. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for being here. Thanks for hosting us today. Um, well, let's start with an easy question. Maybe it's an easy question. Uh, when and where were you born? Uh, September the 3rd, 1933 in Concordia, Kansas, which is right up in the north central part of Kansas, right next to Nebraska. Okay, and up in the Great, Great Plains area. Yeah, Cloud County, Kansas. Where is your family a farming family? No, or? no, well, no. No, my dad was high sheriff there for years, uh -huh. and my mother ran a restaurant. How big was the town? Uh, you know, I don't remember. It was probably, it was probably like Springfield used to be 20 or 30 years ago. Okay. It was a, it was a nice town, had uh, two traffic lights, Okay. Um, were you raised and educated there? No. Well, I was. We we lived there until, oh, my dad lost his office and the war came along, and my mother uh, went to Kansas City to work as in the industrial plants. And my dad, his family was powerful people with Santa Fe Railroad, and uh, they got him a job as a as a uh, cinder dick for the railroad and so we moved to Kansas City and that was right at the start of the Second World War. Yeah. Early on. Where did your mother work in Kansas City? She worked in the B-25 bomber plant, what used to be the the uh, Buick Oldsmobile Pontiac plant for uh, General Motors down in Fairfax Industrial District. Uh -huh. She was a certified welder there uh -huh. for many years. Built B-25s. Um, so, uh, when did you first come down to the Ozarks? Did you visit here before you moved here, or what well, brought you to the Ozarks? Well, when my folks retired, uh, my dad retired, and my mother, of course, hadn't worked in years. But when my dad retired from the Santa Fe, why they wanted to get away from Kansas City, we were living out in this way out in the sticks and suburbs in a little place called Muncie, Kansas, and uh, it's out by Bonner Springs and the what's now the big uh, Speedway out there now. Anyway. Uh, they wanted to go somewhere, so every summer I drove them all over the, the Midwest looking for a place, and they finally found a place down here on a place called Joe Ball Road, and uh, they wanted that, and so they bought it, 30 acres, with like 200 feet of lakefront and about 1,000, 1,500 feet of road front, and they bought the whole thing for $5,000 in those days. <laughs> Oh, God, yeah. So what year was this? Was uh, it just after the lake had formed? Or table yeah, lake? yeah. Well, it was... Uh, yeah, let me think. Must have been about 58, 59, right in there somewhere. Yeah, before before John Q. built Kimberling City. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be John Q. Hammonds. Yeah. Yeah, okay, we'll come back to him. Yeah. Um, so, do you know who was Joe Bald? And well, was yeah, I do. Uh, uh, Joseph Philibert was the first permanent white settler in this part of the world. Uh, he and... Uh, I'll think of his name later. Uh, is, he's an important fellow. He, they were financed by a firm out of uh, St. Louis to set up a uh, trading post with the Delaware Indians at what's now Nixa. And uh, so they set up a trading post there and Joe was uh, the uh, Batman for this other fellow. I'll think of his name eventually. But anyway, uh, Joe uh, ran the errands for him and and uh, fixed these guns and did all that sort of stuff. Well, this other fellow was a uh, was a footloose fellow, and he eventually ended up at a place that he wanted to found a town. And up at the junction of the of the uh, Caw and Missouri rivers, and he called his town Kansas Town. And he, what was his name? He is recognized as the father of Kansas City. But anyway, he he went up there to to. That's what he wanted to do. And when they, the Delawares weren't allowed to stay here very long, the Delaware Indians. And so they moved them and they went up there where he was and, and uh, 
and Joe went on running the trading post till the Delaware left. And then when the when the trading post was shut down, why Joe married a lady by the name of Panana Yoakum, uh, and they moved down to the junction of the James and the White, and they founded a dynasty that was there until the lake came in. As a matter of fact, I brought you a present. Uh, Dr. Uh, Robert L. Philibert was uh, one of your deans up at SMS, and I interviewed him before he died uh, for quite an interview with him and his wife, and he was the great grandson of Joe Philibert, mm -hmm. and uh, he was the grandson of uh, Charles Edward Philibert, who was a famous Civil War veteran and everything, and uh, his, so his family had lived there at the junction of the James and the White for 150 years until a lake went in, and then he moved down to Shell Knob. And the interesting thing is, is when I was interviewing him, which I wanted to do because he's, you know, related to one of the most famous white settlers ever here. And uh, and when I got pretty well done interviewing him, it, it was old fashioned. Like you, you would know you're old enough to remember, but that when you talked to the farm families, the wife always stayed in the kind of in the background. That was just the way it was figured. The men talked. And she stayed in the background, and finally she couldn't resist it any longer. And she said, you know, my family's famous too. And I said, oh, really? She said, yes, they are the Shells who founded Shell Knob 150 years ago. <laughs> so did you interview her too? Oh, yeah. S-C-H-E-L-L, yeah. -L, and not S-H-E-L-L, S-H-E-L-L. -L. And so uh, their, their family had both had founded uh, uh, Shell, uh, Shell Knob and and the dynasty at the junction of the James and the White for 150 years, and so it was a fun interview. And I brought you this, which is a tape oh, of the interview. Thank you very much. You want a voice? Now there is a voice. That's Dr. Philibert. Uh, so how well, how to get Joe Bald from? Oh, Philibert. that's what it's going to take. Well, Joe <laughs> Philibert, his he his farm was down there uh, at the junction, and there were three there. When you go down what's now James River Road, Joe Bald Road. There's three mountains down there in a circle, and uh, the, there was a big tall one that was on the west side, and Joe Philibert owned it, and it was called Joe's Bald, because in those days there was a lot of bald top mountains, and Joe's Bald was uh, owned by Joe Philibert. And so the road at that time that went down around through all those mountains was called Joe's Bald Road, which got shortened to Joe Bald Road. Joe Bald. But Joe Ball Road really starts at what they call the Little Store, which is way on down there. James River Road, which is the legal name, starts at 13 Highway and runs clear down to a junction quite a ways down there uh, called the Little Store, which there's a little store that's been there forever and ever. Yeah. And that's where Joe Ball Road starts. And it runs on the rest of the way down the peninsula. Mm -hmm. And also the James, at that point, the James River Road went around behind what's now the little store and went around Joe's Bald Mountain and went down and went across the James River at, uh, at uh, the Philibert Properties and then went up on the other side and went on. So that was a very famous road and crossing. It was a very popular uh, road. It's all underwater now? Huh? Yes, it's all underwater. Well, the little store and most of Joe Bald Road and James River Road are all up on the peninsula, yeah. so they're all there. Yeah, but but where it went across the river and everything, of course, yeah, that's under 150 feet of water. Yeah. Uh, well, you mentioned the Yokums, and yes. uh, one thing I want to ask you about is the Yokum Silver Dollar. All right, that's a, that's a story a lot of people say, oh, it's, it's, a, it's a hogwash, but it's not. And uh, I've written extensively about it, but the Yokums, uh, well, there was two Yokums. There was Jim Yokum, and I can't think of his brother's name, but anyway, they were not a large family. And Panani Yokum was one of their daughters, I don't remember which one, but anyway. Uh, they were hunters and trappers and stuff all up and down the James and the White River. And when the Delaware were transferred here by the government, uh, the government gave them a lot of compensatory silver coins, you know, which they had no use for whatsoever. Uh, but uh, uh, the Philip, the, uh, the uh, Yokums knew where they could get their hands on a bunch of uh, trying to think of the liquor that it was. It was uh, brandy, peach brandy. They knew where they could get several barrels of peach brandy, and they figured out that they could trade peach brandy to the Delaware for their silver dollars. And the family 
had a big debate about it because, you know, nobody in those days had any money. I mean, everybody traded, okay? Mm -hmm. So the smarter people in their family decided that if they had a, all of a sudden a whole bunch of federal silver dollars, uh, the, and the Delawares ended up with a bunch of peach brandy, why the government would figure out what was going on and they'd be in deep trouble. So somebody said, well, we'll melt it down and, and just trade it out as nuggets. And somebody says, well, why not we just mint our own money? So they made a mold and cast Yoakum silver dollars from the federal silver dollars that they got from the Delaware when they traded them for peach brandy. And of course, nobody could claim that they were federal money. They, it was, but uh, they just melted it down and cast, they didn't mint it, they cast it, they were cast coins. And nobody, has, nobody I know of has ever really seen a real one. However, uh, my son-in-law, his father, and his family came here many years ago, many, many years ago, and they were looking for the for the Yoakum silver dollars. And uh, he has bought property and excavated for years, and he claims he's found them and everything, but it's, he's just, it's his story. But at one time, some people down close to what's now Silver Dollar City, down on, down towards what's now the lake, uh, tore down an old cabin and tore it up, and they found a bunch of Yoakum dollars under the floor. So there are people who have seen them, but nobody knows what happened to them. So this would be on Indian Point? Yeah, it was down in there somewhere. Yeah. And somebody tore an old cabin down, there was a bunch of them hidden under the floor. And that's the only bunch that has ever been seen. So they basically took federal silver dollars uh, and uh, recast them as Yoakum dollars. Yoakum so. silver dollar, yeah. Because one version of the story I've read or heard was that there was a hidden mine somewhere at the end. Of no, that's that's all. That was that was all stories they put out. Uh, that's where they got the silver. <laughs> they got it from a mine that the that the Indians told them where it was because the conquistadors had told them where it was and so on and so forth. But that was all just a cover up. Okay, it was, they, a, it, it, it was all about trading, bartering for peach brandy. Yeah, and <laughs> and, and of course the, the Delawares had a ton of silver dollars, but they had no use for them. They, it meant nothing to them, but it, you know. Trinkets. Or yeah, so they just traded the, the uh, yeah, traded them out of it. Uh, so you came down with your family, uh, the family into which you were born, yeah. uh, in 58, somewhere around there. Well, no, they did. I didn't come down for oh. several more years. Oh, okay. So you'd, you'd seen the, you, you helped them to find a retirement yes, place. Yes, I did. And when did you become interested in living in the Ozarks? Uh, I didn't. Uh, <laughs> my, my folks wanted me to come down here, and of course I wasn't interested. And I was a graduate engineer, and I was running a big, major electrical construction company in, in Kansas City. And I was on my rise up there. I was a shining star in Kansas City at the time, young fella. And uh, I was just doing great. And then I developed something that the doctors thought was throat cancer. It turned out to be a benign singer's node, but a huge one. And when they took it out, I lost my voice for two months. And you can imagine, as an estimator and engineer without a voice, how well my career lasted. So. We just, my wife and I threw in the towel and came down here to and build a place to start over again down here with the folks. And uh, at one time I was the biggest builder developer on Table Rock Lake for several years. And uh, 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 people say, oh my gosh, Jim, you must have made a lot of money. And I, well, let me tell you, there's so many funny stories. I, I got to be very careful. I'll take up your whole hour telling silly stories. That's but, all right. uh, there was, when I got down here, there were two other builders here three. Uh, there's there's cute stories involved with that. One of them was uh, uh, Earl Quick from Reed Springs and, and Earl had built some barns and a couple of houses for his friends and everything. So what he saw, you know, he was smart enough to see this was an opportunity to make some money. So he went around there with his pickup truck and was a builder. And uh, uh, I don't know if he did all his trim work with a chainsaw or not, but I wouldn't be surprised. And then there was uh, from, uh, uh, oh, what is it up by, going up towards Springfield, I'll think of it pretty soon, but anyway, there was uh, another one up there. Uh, Ozark? Or? Yeah, well, uh, no, it was a resort town for years. Uh, anyway, he, uh, he was a farmer and a well-to-do farmer, and he had built some barns and houses and stuff, and so he came down and uh, John Short, and he became a pretty good builder. 
And uh, I used to kid John. I used to say, why don't you and Earl join and, and form one company? And he said, well, why the hell would I want to do that? And I said, well, then you can be short and quick. <laughs> he didn't think that was funny. <laughs> I did. <laughs> So, um, so how did you go from being an electrical engineer to being in construction? How did you well, decide I started that? Out, you saw the opportunity? Yeah, I started out building boat docks in Kansas City because it was a, uh, there's several lakes they developed up there and I saw it as a chance to make some bucks on the weekend and my next door neighbors and I yeah. built a shop and we started building boat docks for people and uh, did, did well at it and then people started asking me to build this and build that for them, you know, in my spare time, my ha ha spare time. And I oversaw it. I didn't do it myself. I oversaw it, but and I got into it. And then when I came down here, I I started a little electrical construction company. And uh, as soon as I saw that the building was, you know, where the money was, well, I started building. Now, now that there's an interesting story attached to that that I want to tell you. Uh, oh, let me tell you about the third builder. It was pretty cute because after I'd been building for a couple of years, I found out this guy was over across the lake somewhere, and and people said, oh, he's booked two or three years in advance. And I thought. Wow, boy, he must be one heck of a guy. So I looked into it to see, you know, find out what the competition is all about. Turned out that he and his two sons were builders, but they did everything. They wired, plumbed, poured the footings, poured the foundations, did the sheetrock, painted it, they did it all. And so they had one house that they built every year. And he had two houses to build for the next three years. So <laughs> <laughs> that's how come he was booked so far in advance. But they did it all. They didn't even have any subcontractors. So. But anyway, um, so this has been what early '60s when you were yeah, starting off yeah, down about here. Yeah, '64, and uh, her folks came down here in '62 and built this, and I came here down here about '64, and uh, and got to building, and uh, I was quite a builder. And I was going to tell you that that uh, uh, people say, oh my, you know, at that time of the, of the thing when everything was blowing and going here, and you were developing all these properties and everything, you must have made a lot of money. I said, yeah, and I said, I'll tell you. In my history, all my years with John Q. Hammonds and everybody else, my accountants have called me twice over the years and said, Mr. Barrett, we are pleased to inform you that on paper, now not in cash, but on paper, you are a millionaire. And I, wow, far out. And within a couple of years, my banker was calling and said, Mr. Barrett, how do you expect us to honor all these checks that are coming in? I said, well, pay them out on my accounts. And they said, you ain't got no accounts. Your wife was in this morning and cleaned you out. <laughs> so uh, that's why my company was Phoenix 3. It was the third time around. It came back. It's kind of typical for builders. It's, yeah. uh, you know, flush times and then... Uh, and uh, it's a rough, dirty life. And uh, yeah. and my wife, uh, they took the money and man. Now, where did you, uh, you meet your wife? The one, this one, well, uh, my uh, son-in-law, oh, I was going to tell you about him, it's Kelby Ayers, and the Ayers family were the ones that came down and did all the claim that they knew where the silver mine was and everything, but no, they've never found it. They've never found any Yoakum dollars. Uh, Artie has a standing offer of $50,000 for a legitimate Yoakum silver dollar if anybody can ever show him one. But anyway, uh, uh, Kelby came and got me out of the mental ward up there, and uh, where I was recuperating from being an alcoholic and, and prescription drug addict. And uh, I came down here and worked for him and worked for a while. And then eventually <clears throat> he took me around to the various places to meet people. And my daughter got me lined up with my present wife, who is the daughter of the people that built this place. And we hit it off and got married and, and have done quite well since. Did you meet here? No, we met at the, at the pier, which okay. was John Q's uh, restaurant. And, uh, but she was, she owned Century 21 Real Estate here, and she was John Q. Hammond's secretary for a number of years, and uh, she she did quite well, and uh, and uh, she and I hit it off. We, we did quite well. Good. Uh, so let's talk about John Q. Hammond's and your relationship with him. When did you first meet him? Well, of course, I bumped into John a few times when I was here, and he was he had a, an a adjutant called Lloyd Kip. And Lloyd was uh, his man in the field, and Lloyd was a builder in his own right, of course. He had some subdivisions and houses of his own, but he did John Q's stuff for him. And uh, John had no children, so Lloyd was sort of his about-to-be-adopted son, so to speak. And, uh, and Lloyd, uh, Lloyd built these buildings, that side of, the, of here, and built the Holiday Inn for him and all the other stuff. And, uh, 
he was overwhelmed in Springfield and he asked me if I'd come up and build some stuff for John Q. So I went up and met John and I went to work for Lloyd. I mean, I didn't work for him. I worked for him in a, together with him. Uh -huh. And I built several motels and some apartment buildings and a bunch of stuff for John Q up there. And of course, met him a lot of times while I was up there. In Springfield. Remember any of yes. the names of the projects? And, uh... Uh, I could take you to them, but I can't remember the names of them. Okay. Apartment complexes. Yeah. I don't know. So this would have been about mid '60s, late '60s. Yeah, late '60s. Okay. So you mentioned John Q built the Holiday Inn here, which was his first hotel. Yeah, and there's a funny project. story connected with that. He uh, when he uh, when I what was that guy's name? Uh, the guy that founded the Holiday Inn chain. Well, anyway, John heard about it and he thought it would be a good thing for him to get involved in. Uh, so he and one of his associates went off down to. Uh, there's a good book you should have, and, uh, and it's, it's called, they call him John Q. Uh, you might write that down. It's a book that you sh really should acquire. It's called, they call him John Q. Uh, and it, it's a story of John Q. Hammonds from the time he was a football coach or basketball coach out west and, and his rise to fame and everything. But he and his associate went to meet with this fellow uh, and wanted to buy a franchise or so they stated and this guy knew about John Q. Hammond so he just doubled the price he didn't want him to have any so he doubled the price of the franchise and John bought five of them <laughs> <laughs> and one, one of them he put here and they built it and it was 60 units and it was his very first holiday in and there's a cute there's cute stories to everything uh, uh, while John was building it of course he was a typical developer builder and he was always running out of money and he kept running out of money and he couldn't pay his plumbers and so his plumber came to him and his plumber was a pretty powerful guy from Springfield and he was a friend of John's and he you know was saying John you know you, you're gonna have to pay these bills and stuff and so he and John got together and formed two sports from Springfield and that corporation still exists and it was uh, I'll think of his name he's he's a famous builder up there I think he's dead now too but he was John, he and John formed that. And John went on to be the biggest Holiday Inn owner in the world two or three times and sold out to Holiday Inns because he had more units than they did. And, and his uh, plumber became president of Holiday Inns International and was until he died, I guess. Mm -hmm. And so they, but they both started here with that little 60 unit Holiday Inn. Mm -hmm. uh, and you were living in the area and you were working yeah. Were you working for John Q when he built that? Did you, no, did no, you, no. This I didn't get here till after that was built. No. Um, so you've developed a, uh, an avid interest in Ozark's history and culture. Yes, um, and how I did have. that develop? As you okay, well, I'm glad you asked because it's another interesting story. <clears throat> when I started building here, of course, uh, the f people I ha hired were, as it turned out, and I didn't realize what I was doing. I mean, I did what I needed to do. Uh, but we're all natives, natives, because the lake people, as we call them, the people that come here because the lake was here, uh, were all either hoping to get rich or were rich building properties or uh, they were crooks, you know, hoping to steal money or, you know, there were all kinds of lake people, but none of them were interested in physical work for a living. They were all wanting bucks. And so the natives all worked for me because, you know, that's what they'd done all their lives. And, uh, uh, and we built for the lake people. The lake people had the bucks and the natives did the work. And so it, one day with a number of beers and a lot of thinking and working on paperwork, I had a, what they call, I guess, an epiphany. It dawned on me that I was seeing something that was really historically important. You know, for years I'd read about the white people going west and displacing the Indians and, and uh, killing them and running them off and, stealing their property and everything else to get their land and everything and uh, and uh, one civilization completely replacing another one and here I was right in the middle of that happening here uh, one of the lake people was an entirely different civilization replacing the civilization that had been here for pushing 200 years and uh, and I was right in the middle of it and I'll tell you how I'll give you a story that's you know I, I suppose your readers or your listeners will love this someday but I, I didn't buy a, a tract of ground next to one of my subdivisions, unfortunately. And that was where my carpenters parked when they came to work for me. 
and uh, there were some wealthy, wealthy people from oh, up in Minnesota somewhere bought that piece of ground and they wanted me to build their house and I was swamped and they couldn't get to it so they had somebody else build it, I don't know who. Of course there was other builders by then. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, uh, but it was uh, uh, Harold Bell Wright. No, not Harold Bell Wright, he was a writer. Who was a really super famous uh, uh, architect. Uh, uh, huge. Yeah. Uh, well, anyway, it was his. He was one of the deans from from uh, University of Arkansas, and he was. Uh, well, he became dean of architecture at, at the University of Arkansas. But he was uh, uh, that fellow's one of his principal students, mm -hmm. and so he designed a house that looked just like that guy had designed it. What was his name? Oh, he built a lot of famous. Yeah. Uh, he'll come to me. Yeah. Well, anyway, he was his one of his famous students and he built this house. So I was always sorry I didn't get to build it because that would have been fun. But anyway, my carpenters parked on that ground. Well, after they got their house and got down there, they came and told my carpenters that if they didn't stop parking out in their woods, they were going to call the sheriff, which they did. The sheriff came and told the boys, you know, you can't park here anymore. They said, well, this is crazy. You know, it's undeveloped. It's, it's just the woods. We want to park in the shade. And he said, well, this belongs to those people from Minnesota and you just can't park here anymore. Really hacked the boys off. So they had to go out to park in my vacant, one of my vacant lots and out in the sun, you know, and they didn't care for that because they'd been parking in those shade for years. Well, anyway, one day we were building a house down in one of my subdivisions and next to this piece of ground that I didn't get to buy. And, uh, and they were eating lunch with their Viennese, Viennese you know, the Vienna sausages and, and beer and stuff. And, and uh, I was shooting off my mouth, which I have a tendency to do. And, uh, we were talk, got to talking about those people, and, and, and the boys were talking about, you know, they couldn't park there anymore, and the sheriff had come up, and then these people had come up and put up barbed wire fences and wouldn't let them park out there anymore, and, you know, on and on and on. And I said, you know, I said, well, you know, there's a big gully on both sides of that ridge, and I said, it's full of dead trees and, and leaves and stuff, and I said, one of these days she'll catch fire and we'll burn them out. Just shoot my mouth off, you know. Well, which could happen, you know, because there's big old gullies down there full of dead stuff and just shooting off and, and one of the old boys was eating and drinking his beer and pretty soon he said when do you want her to happen Jim and I said what he said when do you want her to burn out I, oh god well I started backpedaling and trying to get out so one of the fellows that was a good friend of mine came to me and he said Jim he says you gotta be real careful what you say he says the boys think a lot of you and he said yeah you want them people burn out they'll burn them out <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> so I was very careful from then on what I said yeah. and did because uh, they took me literally. So uh, you employed a lot of the, the local natives uh, yeah. in your business. Oh, yeah. You're almost like a, and you worked, you built homes and other structures for yeah. the lake people. Yeah. Um, and the lake hadn't been there that long. It only no, been here a decade no. or so. No, uh, they'd only been here two or three years when it started. Was there, uh, was there, um, sort of a, a subtle animosity between the locals and the lake people? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, yeah, they, the, the natives had very little use for the lake people. Uh, and of course, lake people thought they were all just redneck hillbillies, you know, uneducated and everything, which some of them were. But a lot of them had some pretty fair education. Uh, none of them that I knew had college education, but they had all gotten through school and had little businesses, some of them, and, you know, uh, farms and stuff, but when the lake came in, it, it wiped out it. But now, Howard Claybo, uh, who was a, a wealthy uh, native man here, uh, owned the big, biggest Chevrolet agency south of Springfield, big Chevrolet agency down Reed Springs, and uh, and uh, I talked to him about it, and I said, you know, uh, boy, Howard, you know, and he sold his agency, and and uh, no, he didn't. He moved it up to what's now Branson West. He built Branson West, Howard Claybo did. Uh, and he uh, he had a lot of properties. He owned a bank. He owned the bank at Table Rock Lake and a lot of other businesses. And and I somehow became acquainted with Howard. I've forgotten how now, but anyway. Oh, I know. Uh, his, his son-in-law was a friend of mine from Kansas City who was a classical fl flute player and music instructor. And my daughter took flute lessons from him, and that's how I met Howard. But anyway, 
I was talking to Howard and I said, my God, Howard, uh, didn't you realize when the lake came in all the business would be here and everything? He said, no. He said, JB, he says, when the lake came in, he said, it wiped out all the farms down where the money was and we figured it was over. And I said, well, but all these fishermen and hunters and everything, he said, we'd had our fill of fishermen. We says, we didn't need any more of them drunken XXX people down here. And he said, uh, you could have bought any of my businesses for 10 cents on the dollar. And I said, holy smoke, and he was serious. I mean, that's the way they looked at it. You know, it was all over. And then, so even off that kind of the rafting period, where there are a lot of raft trips down the oh, there's White, lots of, White River. Lots of, and lots of float trips down the float White River. Float trips. Um, fishing. Big the, time. the locals got to really get, get got kind of tired of that. Oh yeah, uh, and and when the lake came in, they thought it was over with too. They didn't realize the lake would be a different form of good fishing. In fact, some were so upset. These are true stories that I'm telling you. Uh, that several of the of the guys who had conducted float trips down the White and the James for many many years built a big raft of logs and bought all the dynamite they could lay their hands on, and they were going to float down there and blow up the dam. Hmm. They're serious. And of course their wives found out about it and put a stop to it. Or they had all gone to prison. But you know, they were so upset about the dam, they were gonna blow that sucker up so they could go on with their float trip business. So that the, the, the natives seriously resented the, the lake people. So really it was that that tension and, and um, uh, social upheaval and displacement. And some some people probably just left the areas. Oh, lots like of them did. Lots of them sold out and left. But a lot of them, you know, this had been their family's place for a couple hundred years, and they hung on. And, yeah. and some of them are still here. Uh, the more educated, then on the other side of the lake are a bunch of them that aren't so educated, that still uh, run stills and and uh, chop shops and stuff like that. When when I first came down here, it was it was very much like that. In fact, I could go on all night telling you stories. But one of my friends who did a lot of my excavating and paving for me in my developments got both of his knees shot off out here in the parking lot. Uh, he was... Uh, right he, out here? Oh yeah. He was a dope runner. Uh, uh, and he tangled with the wrong people and they had a big shootout and shot his knees off out here in the parking lot. Hmm. But he, he was a dangerous man himself. Uh, his father had been a moonshiner and the sheriff in those days, long years ago, when the rivers were here, and. Uh, the sheriff finally caught up with his dad and shot him and left him to die underneath the old 1923 bridge. Uh, but the family found him and he didn't die. But anyway, uh, it, it was a tough, tough life here. I'll, I'll tell you another true story. This Shepherd the Hills real estate over there, I was, he and I were partners for quite some time in the city here. And, and uh, when Vicky's dad built this building here, uh, he put a real estate agency in here because he hated the land. And that guy's desk was right there in that corner. And he prided himself on getting Lane's customers. And I was over there one day with Lane on business, and oh, he was upset because some of his customers had been coming in here to see this real estate agent. And uh, he was sitting right over there where he could see him. And uh, uh, then all of a sudden he said, oh, oh, and I said, what? And he said, oh, look. And I looked over, and here was a great big old native looking guy standing in front of this guy's desk shaking his hand and his fist at him and they were yelling at each other and I thought whoa what's that and Lane says well he says that's he says he's been sleeping with a woman and that's her husband and he says he's he's been threatening and he's going to kill him if he didn't knock it off and I said oh my gosh so they were yelling and shaking their fists at each other and finally this old boy slammed the desk a few times and he walked out the door right down and went down the sidewalk and out to the parking lot and we were both looking and thinking well that's okay and this stupid guy here, uh, I'll not say his name anyway, he reached in his desk and came out with a big old 38 revolver and Lane said, oh boy. And he ran out this door and was gonna go get him. And Lane says, we gotta get this stopped. So we jumped out and got out of his office and run out here and there was a few cars parked here and trucks and stuff. And, and he was running across the parking lot waving that 38 and that old boy just reached in his truck and brought out his deer rifle and put it up on top of his door and just And he just went rolling in the dirt out here. And I, Oh man, the old boy just put his deer rifle back in the truck, got in, drove off, and we went out in there. And I thought he's dead. His head was all covered with blood and everything. And I thought, oh man, he's killed him. And old Lane rolled him over and got felt his jugular veins, and he still had a pulse. He said, no, he's alive. He's breathing. And since he's got a serious uh, scalp wound and everything, he says he may have a, 
uh, brain damage, I don't know. We, we threw him in the back of my pickup, took him over to the hospital, and he lived. And they became fishing buddies years later. But that old boy, if he'd wanted to kill him, he could have. He just shot him across the scalp. And just just uh, brush it back a little bit. Oh, man. Like to kill him, but he didn't. But anyway, those are some of the crazy things that have happened here, and this has been going on for years. So you've just you've been attuned to what's going on in the region and yes. got interested in some of the history. When of the I region. discovered when that had that epiphany uh, in college and high school, I didn't really like history. It was a bunch of old men with swords and beards whacking each other up over in Europe, and with crazy names and and uh, you know who knew who they were and who cared. But when I got here, all of a sudden I was right in the middle of history. I mean, the Civil War went through here, the ball knobbers, the bushwhackers, you know, insanity. And the, uh, and the, the shootings were still going on. You, they told me, he said, do not go up any of these back roads alone. Because I drove a brand new top of the line pickup truck. And they said, you won't come out. They'll have you shot and they'll have that pickup truck and parts and sold all over Arkansas. I mean, you know, that was their business. And uh, so they said, you know, just be real, real careful. Don't go up any of these back roads alone. And I can tell you a bunch of stories I won't now, but someday I will, of uh, close calls that we had in that regard. But anyway, uh, uh, this this was this was a, a very different place to be in those days. So I wanted to ask you, often Stone and Taney counties are kind of combined. People all talk about Stone and Taney counties. It's like, almost like one region. Do you, you see it that way here well, in Stone yeah, County? Well, yeah, because this, start, this all started out as being Green County clear down to the Arkansas border. And then when Stone was created, it was cut out of Taney County. And uh, so they were all part of the same thing. And, and, and most of the natives who lived here, a lot of them didn't know whether they lived in Stone or Taney County. They didn't know, you know. It didn't mean anything to them. So most people around here think of it as just one, one yeah, region. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty much a, an amalgam of interests here. Yeah. Branson and, and here. Now, Branson, the entertainment boom really started in the 60s, correct? Yeah, and in 95 was when it hit the peak. Hit was, the peak? It was huge in 95. So what were the feelings down here during the Branson boom years? And what were people thinking? Oh, well, everybody was fascinated because, you know, that was big money and excitement and everything else, and it didn't impinge on anybody else's property or anything. So, yeah, it, it, most people liked it. All the business people liked it because it you know, brought a lot of people here. And, attracted a lot of big dollars and uh, so it was it was a good thing but of course like all booms it was nuts I mean uh, they built motels over there that, that didn't need to be built and uh, they had at one time more seating capacity in their theaters than Broadway or uh, Las Vegas and, uh, and it was just a nightmare and of course it crested in 95 and went downhill but yeah, I've written a lot about that over the yeah. years. So you have written quite a bit. You know, your interest in history is I've not had, just... Uh, I've had almost 800 articles published locally, regionally, and nationwide. Uh, I've had five books published. Five books? Yeah. A couple of them are novels? Yeah. Uh -huh. But that's not about here, particularly. Uh, the ones that are about here, I self-published, and they're... Uh, they're uh, uh, This, the uh, Springfield Library has three of them that I know of in there that you can't check out because there's not no more copies uh, in their reference area. And I don't know where some of the others are. Uh, the library here has two or three of my books. Uh, they're self-published books, but uh, uh, they are the history of the area, uh, those books are. And uh, those I self-published because, you know, I, could, I probably could have got somebody to publish them, but I did not. Yeah. There was a fellow whose books you also ought to be looking into uh, by the name of Elmo Ingenthon. Mm -hmm. And Elmo published, he was a... Over in Forsyth? Yeah, he yeah. was a huge historian. Yeah. There's an interesting story about him. Uh, Elmo, uh, uh, he was fairly well fixed. And he was, a, uh, he was a, uh, in charge of all the schools over there. I can't think of a superintendent of all the schools in that area. And uh, he founded the... White River Valley Historical Society and many other things. And Elmo was quite a writer. And his books were all published by the School of the Ozarks. And he wrote some, some quite some nice books. Uh, they are more historically oriented, uh, I mean, uh, like textbooks rather than novels. Uh, but they were, they were some very fascinating books. But anyway, 
he needed pictures for his books. And of course, back in those days that he was writing about, there were no pictures, there's no photographer, there's no pictures. So he acquired the services of a World War II veteran in Springfield who was a quite uh, good painter. And he would describe to him the scene he wanted and the people and everything else. And this guy would paint two foot by three foot oil paintings for him. And uh, over the months, they would work together to get the picture just exactly the way that, that Engel, uh, Elmo wanted them. Then he would take them to the School of the Ozarks and they would photograph them in black and white and put them in his books. So the pictures that you find in Elmo's books were painted by this painter in Springfield. Okay. Well, uh, uh, when I was portraying Joe Philibert, which I did for many years, and I spoke all over the Midwest and, and for, the, for the Missouri Humanities Council, and uh, I spoke one day for uh, the ladies in Forsyth at the library there. And uh, uh, I knew of Elmo Anglaton, I didn't know anything much about him, but I, I you know, I being a historian, I'd run into a bunch of his stuff and acquired as many of his books as I could find because they're very good historically correct books. <clears throat> and so I was lecture, lecture speaking to those ladies there and <clears throat> after I was done, uh, the guy that helped me was a technician, a sound and lighting man from the movies in Hollywood and he was an Emmy Award winner in his own field. But he had retired here, and uh, and uh, he tried to work in the theaters in Branson and didn't work out. He didn't like them, so he and I were buddies, and he helped me set up, tear down my sets. And uh, so he was tearing down my set, and I went into the library to, because you know I like libraries, and I wanted to see what they had that might be historically interesting for me to acquire or borrow or rent or whatever. And I was going through their books and looking around, and I happened to look up, and up above the shelves were a bunch of two by three foot oil paintings and they looked kind of familiar. I couldn't place them. And I kept looking at them and finally I went out and got the librarian to come in there and she then she told me those were Elmo Ingathon's paintings that this guy in Springfield had done for him. And when he died, his family came from wherever they came from and tried to give his stuff to the everybody and nobody wanted it. So they were burning it in his backyard. All of his records and his books and his everything. And the paintings were out there. Well, this Dr. Black's wife, who was a, a, a dentist, well-to-do, she got some women together and they ran up there and rescued everything and they gave it all to that Forsyth Library, mm -hmm. Elmo's collections, including the paintings. And so I asked her if we could get permission to photograph those and uh, preserve them and she said, yeah. So John was you know, quite an expert photographer and had all the, knew everything about floodlights and everything else. So. A couple of months later, we got over there with all kinds of floodlights and cameras and easels and everything. And we got down all those paintings and put them on the easels and floodlighted them and we photographed them and uh, and preserved them. Well, to make a long story shorter, <laughs> not particularly short, but anyway, eventually I discovered that this painter was still alive in Springfield. So, and of course, like you, uh, with your documentation, I knew that I couldn't do anything with those paintings without his permission, so I, and El Elmo was dead, so, and I had no idea what family he had from California, but anyway, uh, so I put together a really nice book. I printed out these pictures and put them in a binder and fixed it all up really nice, and John and I went up to meet with him. Charming old gentleman. He was a World War II veteran, had fought across Germany with the uh, Patton's people, and his wife was a very interesting lady with a heavy accent, and she was a World War II death camp Pollock that was in there to be killed, and he had been one of the people that, that broke into the camp and rescued her and eventually married her. Charming lady. Wow. Yeah, and really nice people. They were really fun people. And anyway, so I interviewed him, and somewhere I've got one of these tapes of an interview, only it was a videotape of me interviewing him, uh, and I gave him his book, which thrilled him, because he had not seen these pictures in years. And so I, somewhere in my files, I've gotten written permission to do whatever I want with those pictures. And I'll show them to you. There's, there's a whole set of all 22 of them out here in the lobby. Okay. And we'll look at those. Yeah. 
Uh, so you mentioned that you were doing uh, I don't know, I don't know, the historical theatrical lectures. Yeah, right? I had a, I had a theater right there. Uh -huh. I had a stage, drapes, the whole nine yards, and those lights up there were mine. And uh, I had a sound stage here and everything. And uh -huh. we uh, we held a, every Wednesday or Thursday night, I've forgotten which. Well, we we would have a show here, and, and I would get all kinds of interesting historical people to that would come up here and do music and tell stories and and uh, so on and uh, some we, we had some really fun and interesting people here and of course I was the biggest duck in the puddle I told stories <laughs> and, and uh, everything but uh, so you charge admission was yeah that well that? yeah we we just asked people for six bucks a piece you know yeah and uh, they were cheerful to pay that yeah but we'd have 30 40 people in here and so you know that paid the way yeah I didn't make any money, but how'd you get how'd you get involved in that? How, was well, you know, uh, <clears throat> Thursday night, I guess it was was really a dead night in those days here, and uh, I decided that you know it would be a good thing to do something to entertain people here and draw some more people in, and uh, it turned out to be a fun thing, so we just kept going, and and it, it turned into quite. We had quite a stage here, and uh, we had a lot of good acts here, uh, not acts, uh, they were. Uh, historians and musicians and all, all kinds of people from it's kind of a variety show. Yeah, a variety show of, yeah. of, of all historically inclined. Yeah. Uh, now I'm trying to think what he was. It was one of the professors, one of the professors from the University of Arkansas, uh, came here to entertain. And uh, you know, people would always tell me about other people, and we'd find out about them and talk to them, and they'd come. And he came here to entertain and he had two uh, young kids, much younger than him, mm -hmm. who were fiddlers and they had never lost a contest that he'd entered them in. <sighs> they were good. And uh, man, he was a marvelous guitar player. In fact, he was recognized as one of the best bluegrass pickers in the Midwest and he was one of the deans down there at the University of Arkansas and he would periodically come up and bring those two boys up to fiddle. and. And play, and he had three guitars up there. And I, one time, I asked him. I said, "How come you got three guitars?" He said, "Boy, he said if I if string breaks on one of these or gets out of tune, he said I just grab another guitar. I can't." He said, "These boys will not wait for me." <laughs> they did. Uh, you also started uh, an, a foundation called the Wilderness Road of the Ozarks. The Wilderness Road Association of the Ozarks, and it was uh, it was a, and we held festivals all around here. Uh, for a number of years trying to raise interest and money. And uh, we were doing good over at the, at the park in uh, down down there by the government. But she started charging us uh, to rent her ground. And uh, she wanted all of my entertainers to pay her to, to camp there. And so we finally moved to several other places that never worked any place else. But that it was a 501c3 group and it still exists uh, but I just burned everybody out doing that thing every year you know uh, just got too exhausting oh yeah you know because uh, we put a lot of effort into it every year how many years did you do it five years five years yeah. when was that 90s or? <clears throat> yeah yeah late 90s yeah but it, it went well I mean but it just you know it wasn't that we didn't make enough money and it just burnt too many people out they had fun doing it but you know, they had other lives they needed to go on with. Yeah. Um, so, uh, in Stone and Taney counties, what what do you think was the most important event in what what we see today? Was it the Shepherd of the Hills novel? Was it the well, coming of the railroad? Where, was that's it? where it started. It started with it, it, the tourism here started with the Shepherd of the Hills novel, of course, uh, which was the second or third most popular read book in history. And uh, a lot of people believed in it wholeheartedly. They, you know, they, it was a time, it took, it, it happened at a time at the turn of the century when people were becoming interested in the outdoors and health and exercise and all that sort of stuff. So, and about this, and as, as, as it so happened at the same time that he wrote that novel and it became hugely popular, the railroad came through Branson in fact, Branson was founded as a railroad town by the railroad. Uh, they built it to service their railroad. Uh, that's how it started. And uh, 
uh, and people came down by the hundreds and got off there and wanted to go see all these people. And there was a lady there who had a big old wooden spoke wheel Buick and she made a fortune hauling those people out to, to uh, uh, where... Uh, the post office. Yeah, and all that stuff was, yeah. yeah. But anyway, uh, that started it. That was the first wave and then uh, of course, the next wave was uh, when they opened the Shepherd the Hills Farm, and then when Silver Dollar City opened, well, of course, that was gangbusters. Yeah, we haven't talked much about Silver Dollar City. Did you ever, did you ever build anything in Silver Dollar City? No, uh, yeah. but I knew the Hershians very, very well. Yeah, so tell me about uh, your experience with the Hershians and the growth of Silver Dollar City. Well, I met the Hershians early on, and uh, and uh, but I wasn't really interested in building there. Well, I can't say I wasn't interested. I just was never invited, so I didn't push my way in. And they had their own crews, pretty much. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, the Hershians, okay, when, when Shepherd the Hills Farm was built, uh, Mary Trimble was Marx Trimble's mother. And Mary, when her husband died, she was the boss, and, uh, and was until she died. And I mean, everybody at the Shepherd the Hills Farm did what Mary Trimble said. And the same way at the Hershians, Mary Hershian, was the boss. You didn't cut a tree or a bush without seeing if it was okay with Mary Hershon. I mean, you you lost your job if you cut a tree without talking to her. And uh, she was she was the boss, and we call them the two Queen Marys of 76 Highway. And they were the boss. There was no getting around that. And uh, and when when she built uh, Silver Dollar City didn't exist. She, it was uh, she and her boys came down. And they they did uh, Marble Cave. Mm -hmm. And uh, Marble Cave did well, and, but it's a story that a lot of people don't know. There were so many people that hung around up, up on top waiting to get into the cave that they decided to make some money by building a little town for them to shop, and, and that's where Silver Dollar City came from. So when it started growing, not like dynamite, uh, she gave Silver Dollar City to Pete to run, and she gave Jack the cave to run which almost cost him his life, because when he built the railroad up out there, the train ran away and almost killed him. Uh, so there's a lot of stories there, but uh, Jack Hershon ran the cave and Pete ran the city. Mm -hmm. And that's how she kept him from fighting. And, uh, but as long as she was alive, she was the boss, big time. But it's, uh, it, it grew, and, and that was a big rush. And then, and then when they started developing, uh, uh, and it started, it started when, uh, oh Lord, what was his name? I'll think of it in a minute. Uh, Charlie, Charlie Sullivan? No. Anyway, he built the theater up there that, I uh, can't even think what's there now, but anyway, uh, he, he brought down uh, the first serious entertainers, out of town entertainers, and then it just grew from there as different entertainers. And, Andy Williams? Yeah, he brought, he brought, no, that was, Andy Williams a long time later. Roy Clark? <laughs> yeah. The first people he brought down were, the first people he brought down were um, the people from, uh, huh, is that funny? Hee Haw, the, the video production of Hee Haw. Mm -hmm. He brought them down. He built a theater just for them. That was the first thing that was here. At the Hee Haw Theater, and uh, uh, and then of course he built the next big theater next to it, and and just dynamite grew from there. But uh, uh, when uh, uh, another one of my clients, I think of his name, uh, Lord of Mercy. Well, anyway, when he bought the Hee Haw Theater, and he was going to have it remodeled for his girlfriend, he had me do it, and I went in there. You talk about stupid. And the walls were lined for that whole theater with bigger than life-size plywood cutouts of all the Hee Haw stars, uh, all the stars there, and uh, and the mules and everybody else. They were all around that theater, and I loaded those in the pickup truck and we took them to the dump. And uh, we remodeled that theater for this old boy's girlfriend, and she was she was not good. I mean, I guess she was good for him, but she sure wasn't good as an entertainer. But anyway, he had the money in. And uh, so I ended up building his house for him, and I built a bunch of stuff for him. Uh, what the heck is his name? 
know anyway. His wife was the most famous writer. Janet Daly, Bill Daly. Mm -hmm. The Daly's, I built all the stuff for them mm -hmm. you know, over the years. Uh, did you ever meet Charlie Sullivan, the man who developed Frontier City, USA, over in Oklahoma City, and then no. helped the Hershens conceptualize nope. Silver Dollar City? No. Nope. Yeah. Never met him. Uh, tell us a little bit about Joshua Heston and the State of the Ozarks website. You do some writing for them? Uh, yeah, not much, but some. Uh, but Josh is uh, he's a go-getter, and he, he publishes this paper, and he and I have worked together quite a bit, and I admire his work, and he admires my work. and. Uh, I've sent him some some good you know, stuff and clients and things, and but he's a he's a he's a driver and he's a, he's this is his in fact this is a right now is a annual celebration of one of his year, fifth year or sixth year or whatever it was he's been published. So, uh, but I don't uh, I haven't met him but once personally. But he's a he's an interesting guy and he you know I admire the fact that he's got guts enough to publish that paper and drive the way he does. Mm -hmm. uh, come back to John Q. Hammonds for a moment. So tell us about the last time you saw John Q. Okay, uh, it, you have it. I gave you the thing. That's when the last time I saw John was in his apartment up at the top of his, uh, it wasn't the towers, it was someplace else. At University Hill. Plaza yeah, Hotel? Yeah, yeah, up there. And John was still John Q. Hammonds, but he didn't have the snap and the drive that he'd had for the many, many years I knew him. But he was still, he wasn't crazy or out of his mind or anything. He just he didn't have the flash that he had, you know. I mean, John was like, talking to him and dealing with him was like working with a tornado. I mean, he just, but, and so when Vicky and I went to see him and chat with him and I did that interview, uh, he was not a tornado anymore, but he was still fine. You know, he was, there was nothing wrong with him. He just wasn't a, uh, a dive bomber like he had been for so many years. That was the last time I saw him, and then they committed him to rest home. Uh, was he was he the kind of guy who uh, wanted everything done yesterday? And oh yeah, John was. It, John was demanding, but he wasn't unreasonable. But he was uh, he was he was demanding. I mean, you know, he yes, he wanted everything done yesterday because that's how you made money. And uh, uh, but he was John was not an unreasonable person but he was he was tough he was a tough nut and he knew what he was doing and he he was he was shrewd and he was a hard driver but uh, John paid his bills and he treated everybody fair and square that I know anything about and I, I'll tell you the sad moment that not everybody knows uh, I don't even know if it's in the book uh, they called him John Q uh, but Lloyd Kipp was his adopted son I mean he just if, if Lloyd had minded his P's and Q's, he had uh, inherited all of John's property. But what he did, something went wrong. And John, as I told you, Kip was his own self-builder. He built a lot of homes and stuff. And the story came up to me that Kip had been sending a lot of carpet that was for John's motels to his company to build into his houses, among other things. And uh, and when John discovered that, he had somebody investigate, and they found out that Lloyd had been purloining a bunch of stuff. Mm. Now that's the story, and of course, it's as you know, story. there's two sides to every story. Yeah. But they had a big falling out, and Kip went his way, and John went his. But John and I talked about that a few times, not deep into it, uh, but you could, and because John didn't want to talk about it. But when the sub subject came up of Kip moving on, you could tell it really hurt. John really, really hurt him because he had, he had pretty much thought that Kip was going to be his heir. Mm -hmm. Didn't work out. When did that happen? What, how, how, uh... You know, I don't know when. But Kip was, uh, <clears throat> Kip was wealthy in his own mind, uh, own way, and, and I, you know, I find it hard to believe that he would steal from John, but you never know. You know, in the construction business, a lot of things happen. Well, thanks for chatting with us today. Is there anything else you want to add? Uh, well, nothing specifically, except I brought this for you. This, uh, all the stuff I took up to Galena, uh, this is a database of it for your files. Okay. So that your people, if they want to, need, there's, there's a ton of books 
and a ton of videos and documents and maps and charts and God knows what all. That's a database of it all. So this is a listing of what you gave to the Stone County Library at the Delaney. Correct. So this is like the bulk of your um, yes. collection yes. that you've acquired. Great. That's good to know. Got that database there, you know, for your research people. Yeah. And all that stuff's available up there. Or that's the, the way I gave it to them is it needs it, it is to be available to the public. Yeah. And uh, that's a 50-year collection yeah. of stuff up there. And the reason I gave it to them is because I didn't, my daughter, uh, who is wealthy, she's married to Kelby Ayers, who has Ayers Advertising, a big sign company and everything. And she has told me, Daddy, I don't want your crap when you die. <laughs> you know, do something else with it. And uh, so I had no way to leave it to, and I just didn't want it burnt in the backyard when I died. So yeah. I rounded it up and took it up to the library. Well, it's still out in the garage where I left it, okay? But they have a new librarian who I'm going up to meet tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And she is uh, an experienced librarian that they've hired from somewhere. And the other guy retired or something, moved on. And so that's why nothing's been done. But anyway, I'm to meet with her tomorrow and, you know, discover what her intention is with my stuff because it's still sitting out in the garage. I mean, several truckloads of it. Really? A lot? Yeah. There's a lot of stuff here. Oh, yeah. Well, thanks again very much. Uh, we've been speaking with Jim Barrett, um, who's a longtime uh, resident of Kimberling City and uh, the Mid Ozarks. Yes, the Mid Ozarks. I, I wanted to research the Ozarks, but it's there's just too much in the Ozarks. So I've pretty much confined myself to what I call the Mid Ozarks, which is you know Springfield to uh, to uh, 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 well Arkansas and, and Branson and this area. That's yeah. That's why there's enough stuff happened here to lifetime study. Is that how you th conceptualize the Ozarks? Is as like the northern Ozarks, which is um, Lake of the Ozarks in that region, and the yeah. mid Ozarks, and then the Arkansas Ozarks? Yeah. 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 And if you see Jim uh, Coombs, uh, he's got that map, yeah. which you'll enjoy, I think. Okay. But it is the Ozarks as. Uh, What's that guy's name? He was your ge geological guy for many years. You say he's still alive, but anyway, he and the and the guy same his uh, equal from University of Arkansas and one from Oklahoma all agreed that that was it. And it's it isn't arbitrary. It's based on a lot of statistical things and geography and early settlements and all kinds of stuff that define it pretty much as the Ozarks. Well, thanks very much. It's my pleasure. I've enjoyed talking to you. Thank you. And I hope I haven't, you know, dwaddled on. And no, that was good. There was a lot of good stories in there. And, uh, so yeah. Well, you know, I could. I've, I had a theater here for five years, and yeah, I did. To my yeah. audience, it's what I've just done to you. I'd tell them <laughs> stories that, you know, uh, of, of the Ozarks. I can tell you enjoy it. Oh, it's it's fabulous. You know, it's. Uh, I'm sorry that I'm getting old and, and worn out, and I can't press on with it because it's just, it's endless, uh, just the history here is just beyond belief. Um, so but anyway. You're as interested today as you ever oh, were. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah, you know, there's just, every time I turn a corner or talk to somebody, when I had my theater here, people would come up to me after the show and say, oh, you should have met my father-in-law or my uncle or whoever. He was a, a wagon master on the Wilderness Road for years. and blah, blah, and, you know, I stuff. I said, God, I'd like to interview him. Oh, he died last week. <laughs> yeah, that was... So do you know of anybody that's really trying to capture in a systematic way the history and culture of the Mid-Ozarks as you've defined it? Not really. Uh, you've got the White River uh, Historical Society, or which the is, White River Valley. Which started out as a as encompassing the whole White River, but they have backed off. They're just pretty much uh, Forsyth. Forsyth in the region. They've got a nice little museum over there. Yeah. But they they backed off to. I was I sat on their board for years as uh, Stone County's representative, but they have backed off now. They to that. Yeah. At one time. They're really focused on Taney County and yeah, the immediate yeah, Forsyth yeah, area. Yeah. yeah. Uh, at one time, and I don't know if you know this or not, but I suppose you do, uh, 
the PBS was out of U.S. mass, uh, and uh, the guy who headed that up, can't even think of his name now, he and, and uh, a bunch of high rollers from Springfield and various places decided they were going to do the voices of the Ozarks. Yeah, something like Ozark's that. Voices. Yeah, yeah, something like that. In the 90s they did a yeah. documentary. Yeah, and and it, it got clear out of hand. I was involved in it, and it got clear out of hand. It was just too too big and too thick. So they, it just boiled down to the Voices of Springfield is what it boiled down to. And I was the guy who went around to do the interviewing. And But I wasn't in any of the videos. I was the guy that sat on the floor and asked the questions that they answered. And I and I had I was trained to ask questions so that when they answered it, they would answer it in a story way, not just yes or no or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I went around at their direction and with their photographers and videographers and all other people and interviewed these people for them. And they did a lot of the Voices of Springfield. And uh, I presume that stuff still exists somewhere. Yeah, it's still it's yeah. still there. And so. This guy, who was headed up PBS, they had after they had done enough to make them happy for a while, they threw a big ball at some place up there, I've forgotten where, and I was there, and this guy from PBS and I had become friends through all this, and he knew about what you are now know about me, and he was excited about doing an actual video of the history of the Ozarks, convinced, you know. And he was really uptight about it, and we were going to do it. And so I started writing the script for it, and we worked and worked at it. And then all of a sudden, he got transferred to Colorado and took over PBS for Colorado. Mm. And so it died. But I wrote the script, and so that script exists for uh, the movie about yeah. the, the history of the Ozarks. Do you think there's any of the Mid Ozarks? Region. Yeah. Are there any aspects about the Mid Ozarks region that you feel are more or less unknown or are underappreciated? Yeah. Uh, well, let me think a minute. I, I think the thing that's underappreciated is what I told you started my interest in this area. And that was the two civilizations clashing and one replacing the other one. Mm -hmm. And I think right there is, is a story worth telling. Of, of all of the settlers who were here for hundreds of years uh, who got displaced or run out or moved on or some places times killed uh, by lake people and the whole thing changed to a whole different civilization here. Uh, that's a story that's, that's never really been told. Uh, I'll tell you one more little quick story. I, I, you know, a lot of people know I write and I've written a lot of books and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of articles. Uh, but anyway, I said, you know, who, who was it that wrote uh, uh, Hawaii and... Missioner? Missioner. James, James Missioner. Yeah, and I said to somebody one time, I said, you know, I wish... Have you ever read uh, Centennial? No, I never have. Well, Centennial is interesting. It, it, Centennial starts out in Colorado, I think it is, and it starts in prehistory days and comes forward through the Indians and then the first settlers and then the next settlers and the families and the millionaires and, you know, on and on and on. But it starts in prehistory. And I said, you know, I wish Michener was still alive. He could do a bang up story about this area. You know, from prehistory to all the craziness that's gone on here. The millionaires that have been here and gone and gone. And, and all the chicanery and skullduggery. And, yeah. uh, and somebody says, my God, you've written 30 books. Why not tell the story the way Michener would do it? And I thought, well, that's interesting. So, and I'd read a lot of missionary stuff, so I decided, well, what the hell? So I started writing the book, and I, then I was looking for the title. And it was to be about the Wilderness Road area, which ran from uh, Barrowville to Springfield. The Wilderness Road was here was created because the farmers here had more crops and, and produce than they knew what to do with, and the railroads were expanding all across the United States, and when the railroad finally came to North Springfield, they saw it as a marvelous opportunity. Uh, the railroad needed anything that they could get, mm -hmm. and the people down here needed to sell it. 
So they built the Wilderness Road, Philibert and, and uh, uh, Kimberly, E.E. Uh, e. Kimberly, A.A. E. Kimberly, I can't remember. Anyway, they built the Wilderness Road. Well, anyway, so I started writing this Michener novel, started in prehistoric times with the prehistoric people and, and made it as authentic as I could and came through with the Indians and so forth and so on and, and on. But I couldn't come up with a title for it because it, it couldn't call it Kimberlake City. I mean, and I thought and I thought and finally it dawned on me that the reason that all of this happened here, that all that everything was here, uh, uh, was because there was a crossing down here on the river, uh, a ford. Mm -hmm. And that's where all the prehistoric animals and the prehistoric people went across, and then the Indians, and then the settlers, and so on and so on. And the, also all the Indian trails, and all of the eventually roads and everything else, kept going across that ford. And then when the Missouri built the first bridge in 1923, they built it down there because that's where all the, everything went. And so the ford then turned into the 1923 bridge. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when the lake was coming in, naturally, they built the Kimberling Bridge mm -hmm. here. And, and so this has been, so I called it the White River Crossing. Mm -hmm. Did you finish the manuscript? I've written a heck of a lot of it. I got up to the 1880s or 1890s, and it was like 293 pages. And so I decided it was going to have to be a series of like three books. I've got the first ones completed. Uh, my understanding is that Johnny Morris from uh, Bass Pro Shops is very interested in the uh, pre-white history of this region. Yeah. Have you had uh, any contact with him? Yes. Mr. Whiteley, who is his right-hand person, and I have met several times, and and uh, I've given him some of my stuff. And Whiteley's a, a very interesting, interesting person, and he introduced me to uh, uh, Morris on a couple of occasions, but. We haven't. He and I haven't had any personal relationships, and I I have in one of my notebooks somewhere Whiteley's name, and it's recently. I thought, you know, I really need to get a hold of Mr. Whiteley, and before I drop dead, and, and see what interest he has in my stuff, and, and he and Johnny, and, and see you know what I can give them, or yeah. because you know I just when I, I'm like my former partner had a cartoon that he got from a magazine that really bespoke our relationship. It showed this frog talking to a caterpillar and telling him about all the new business ideas he had and everything. And the caterpillar agreed and they were doing these things and then the caterpillar turned into a butterfly and went off to do something else. <laughs> and that's me. And my frog was my partner over there. You were the butterfly. And I was a butterfly. That, as soon as I burst out of the cocoon, I went off to do other things, you know. And that, that's just been the thing. I, I have had, uh, I create businesses and run them until something else comes along that's more fun and then I'm off on it. Well, thanks again. It's been a pleasure. Well, it's my pleasure. My Thank goodness. You very much. I love talking to anybody that's interested in this stuff.